Papers, Please tells you more about the kind of person you are in four hours than other games can in 4,000 hours. Released in 2013, this game was a sensation, and for good reason. It challenges your morals like few games before it, and it stands as the best real-world Milgram experiment you'll ever be a part of. Playing through the game with no prior knowledge will answer questions about yourself that you have always wanted to know. A quote from the Mighty Mighty Boss Stones. I'm not a coward, I've just never been tested. I'd like to think that if I was, I would pass. Papers, Please is your chance to be tested, and in this video, I will tell you all about it. I, unfortunately, can't skip right to the end. I need to explain a few things first, because you'll be the one who judges if you have passed or not. The first thing I'll need to go over is the setting. I'll talk about the different historical and popular culture media references that inspired the game so you can better understand what each important piece of the puzzle represents. Then I will cover the gameplay and bring attention to the important mechanics that are necessary to understand what I'm going to be talking about. This game, like many others, has two opposing powers. Most games have an epic battle between good and evil. And while Papers, Please power dynamics aren't so clear-cut, they should be covered before you understand if you've passed your test or not. I will talk about the test as a whole. If you don't know what a Milgram test is, you will by the end of this video, and how this game represents one. I will then wrap up when I talk about the game's best ending and how it reflects every one of your moral choices in its resolution. Before I start though, I want to warn you that this video is going to be filled with spoilers. There is very little about this game that I won't cover. If you haven't played it yet, I beg you to leave. Do a blind playthrough, then come back to watch this video. This game is incredibly short, and I don't want to spoil anything for you. If you watch this video before you play the game, you will never have the opportunity to test yourself like this again. While we wait for them to click off, I'd like to ask the rest of you to subscribe to my channel. I'm releasing content like this every other week and I don't want you to miss out. I ask you to wait before you make your decision though. I want the quality of my video to make your decision an easy one. In order to understand more about the game itself, you need to understand the historical setting the game stems from. The developer of the game, Lucas Pope, has said that the locations of East and West Germany and the tension between them are what helped inspire the locations of East and West Greston. After World War II ended, two of the victors, the United States and the Soviet Union, were ideologically opposing superpowers of the world. The two powers wanted their respective ideologies to take hold. The desire for their ideologies to spread was the basis of the Cold War. The Cold War was a war not fought with military might, but instead fought with espionage and information. Spy warfare was one of the main tools of the opposing governments during this historical period. Germany ended up being a focus of Cold War politics. Germany began to sunder due to the two opposing ideologies present after World War II. The US had sway in the West, and the Soviet Union had sway in the East. In 1949, Germany formally split into two separate nations, the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republic. They were more commonly known as West and East Germany, respectively. The border between East and West Germany closed officially in 1952. However, the border of East and West Berlin remained open, so it was an easy backdoor to East and West Germany's closed borders. However, in 1961, construction of the Berlin Wall began. This wall was erected to stop people who were fleeing from the east into the west. The wall was manned by the East German soldiers, and they were given a shoot-to-kill order for anyone who tried to cross. At least 400 people died between its construction and its fall. The majority of people were killed trying to escape East Berlin. Risking life and limb, 5,000 people did make it over the wall and escape to West Berlin. The wall eventually fell in 1989. This era is the historical background for the game, and where most aspects of Aristotska get their inspiration. 
While the basis of the game is East and West Berlin and the Cold War era based country, it is not strictly based on the US versus the Soviets. Pope explained in interviews that he did everything he could to make the different sides as generic as possible. Anything that would directly tie an in-game country to a real world one would either be completely stripped from the game or would be heavily hosed down so it would be much less identifiable. He also made sure the governments weren't able to be pinned down as one ideology either, because above all he wanted the game to be fun. You might think that's a load of crap and that Arstotska is definitely X ideology, but in the comments on a wiki page for this game, a person wrote a two page long post on how Arstotska is obviously a late capitalist country, and on the same exact wiki page in an unrelated post just as long about how completely obvious it was that our Stotskins were communist. When I see things like that, I tend to think he did a pretty damn good job. While our Stotska isn't specifically based on the Soviet Union or the US, it's based on the idea of a Cold War superpower. I mentioned that espionage was the main way of doing battle during the Cold War. This, along with classic spy movies Pope loved like Argo, served as the inspiration for the Ezek Order. However, don't write them off as the foreign agents taken right from the Cold War. The Born Identity was also one of the inspirations of the Order, which is a story about a rogue spy going against his government and has much more in common with the Ezek Order's motivations. The Order talks about being there at Aristotska's inception, so this is another shadow of the inspiration with a nice Lucas Pope twist. These are the main inspirations for the setting and the two factions of Papers, Please. Now that we have a good understanding of the game settings, I want to talk about the gameplay. If you don't care to hear me cover the gameplay, that's alright, you can go ahead and skip to chapter 3. Papers, Please is an inspection game. If I had to compare it to another game the average person might know about, the spot 5 differences between the two pictures game you've probably seen before is the closest thing I can think of. You play as a border checkpoint inspector, and it's your job to make sure everyone who crosses the border has all of their papers in order. The game starts out on day 1 with you allowing any Arstotskan citizen back into Arstotska and denying all foreigners. As the game progresses, different story elements lead to more and more paperwork ending on the 31st day. On this day, so many rules have been added that you need to check 4 to 5 pieces of paperwork to make sure all kinds of requirements are being met. You need to verify that the passport issuing city is legit, check that IDs, pictures, and names all match. If they don't, you need to check for aliases, fingerprints, do full body searches, and more. Things like making sure paperwork hasn't expired, verifying that their vaccinations are up to date, double checking that all of the stamps are not forgeries, and so on. It's a lot of work and surprisingly comes together to be a really fun experience. While playing the game, you also need to manage your finances with your family's well-being. If you don't have enough money, you can go to jail, have family members die of sickness, or both. So depending on how you perform at the inspection booth, you may need to balance feeding your family with saving money. Even if you're doing your job really well, it's not a bad idea to skip feeding your family from time to time. This may sound harsh, but the reality is that Aristotska is a hard place to live. If you want to make sure you have extra money in your savings as a rainy day fund, sometimes your family is just going to have to go to bed hungry. Let me explain a little bit about what I mean. After every workday, you choose whether or not to feed your family and heat your house. If food costs 20 credits and heat costs 10 credits, then you need to pay 30 credits for heat and food every day. You can skip a day, but people might get sick. This causes a 5 credit expense in medicine for each person that gets sick. Even with the medicine though, it ends up being less than if you fed and heated everyone two days in a row. Instead of 60 credits for two days of heat and food, it only costs 35 credits. 10 for the heat, 20 for the food, and 5 for the medicine. Giving you an extra 25 credits in savings in case something happens tomorrow. Such as a terrorist bombing, or you getting too many citations and having to pay a hefty fine. The game can be broken down into this simple scenario. You look over a traveler's paperwork and then make one of three decisions. 
While you're looking, if you notice a discrepancy, you should use the inspection action to bring attention to it. For example, if someone has two different names on their documents, there could be a reason for this discrepancy, like them having a known alias that lines up with the second name. There could be no explanation for the document, and it's most likely stolen or forged. Once you have sufficiently inspected their documents, you will then make a decision. If all the paperwork looked good, you should approve them to go through the checkpoint. If the paperwork isn't in order, you should reject them and have them leave. If the paperwork is more than not in order, then you have the option to detain them, summoning armed guards to take them away for questioning. When you do make these decisions, you will likely be trying to follow all the different rules I talked about earlier, but you will make mistakes. Sometimes you'll approve people who should have been denied, deny people who should have been approved, forget to clear up a discrepancy in the traveler's story, or any other number of mistakes. Each mess up results in a citation. If you get enough of these citations, you will start to get fines that you have to pay off at the end of the day. Luckily, after the day ends and you've paid your fines, your fines reset to zero. Each successful inspection rewards you five credits. On top of that, if you end up detaining two suspicious individuals, you get an extra five credits. You can also accept bribes for doing something that will likely end in a citation, often being more lucrative than doing what you were supposed to do. There will also be attacks on the checkpoint from time to time. There are two different kinds of attacks that can happen. One of them happens when you let a terrorist through with a bomb attached to them. This will cause them to suicide bomb the guards at the checkpoint. The weight of travelers will be recorded on an entry ticket and given to you after this has happened a couple times. If the current weight of the traveler isn't what it's supposed to be, you will have to do a full body search to see if they have a bomb on them to try and avoid this. The other type of attack is when a traveler tries to jump over the wall or a terrorist comes from inside Arstatska. To deal with these attacks, you will eventually be given access to a gun and you need to use it to neutralize the attackers. Neutralizing the attackers is worth 20 credits and trying to hit them but missing gives you 10 credits. Both of these attacks cause the day to end, meaning less people to investigate and less money. As you play through the game, you can get any one of the 20 different endings. Each one will trigger when specific criteria is met, but a majority of them are considered bad endings. Things like going into debt, your entire family dying, cock blocking your boss, or killing a civilian. The other endings are the true conclusions of the storyline. These will present their conditions naturally during the course of the game. This has not been a comprehensive breakdown of the gameplay. However, if you've never played the game, you should be able to understand what you need to in order for me to talk about the points I want to hit in Chapter 4. So let's break down the story, shall we? The game starts off with you winning a raffle. The prize of this raffle is the position of Passport Inspector at the border checkpoint between East and West Greston. The border is opening up for the first time since Aristotska went to war six years ago. On the first day, you are told to approve every single person with an Aristotskan passport and deny all others. As time goes on, different world events will cause policies to come and go from your inspection rulebook. An example of this is when neighboring country, Kalechia, bans all trade between them and Aristotska. The policy lasted only a single day, though. The trade embargo prompted the Aristotskan government to enforce a new policy that denied access to all Kalechians. The pressure applied to the Kalechian government from the denied citizens was too much to handle, and they revoked the embargo almost as soon as they enacted it. These are how the rules of the game get introduced to you. The results of this delivery system is that the world feels so much more alive than it would otherwise. Each new government policy or obnoxious news reporter causing you grief increases the difficulty of the gameplay. They add one rule after another and increase the overall paperwork each person needs to carry. It can be annoying at times, but it goes to increase the immersion that you are a citizen of Aristotle. Oh. Open borders causing an influx of immigrants taking jobs, causing citizens to complain to their officials? Okay, now immigrants need work permits if they want to work here. And surprise, it's your job to make sure they have them. A deadly outbreak of polio spreading all over the continent? Well, 
we had better make sure every person who's entering has vaccination papers. And by we, <laughs> I of course mean you'd better make sure. You feel the bullshit of the bureaucracy weighing down upon you. The result of this is a little bit of resentment towards your country folk, but it doesn't make you any more accepting of the travelers either. Your job wouldn't be so damn hard if they'd stop forgetting their papers. I don't care if you couldn't make the checkpoint in 10 out, your password still expired. How do you forget you're only here to visit your parents? What do you mean you'll be here for a year? It says you're going to be here for two days. Who makes that big of a mistake? It might not be so bad if most of them didn't already know their paperwork wasn't in order and blame you for all the stupid rules you don't even want to follow. What I'm trying to say is the game does a really good job of never making any one side obviously better than another. In the last chapter, I mentioned there are multiple endings in this game and that the vast majority of them are considered bad endings. While these endings aren't considered the true endings, they do give us a good look at the true face of the two major factions of the game, the Ezek Order and the Arstotskan government. While there are other powers in the world, such as Kalechia and Oberstan, your actions don't have a major impact on them. I want to dive deeper into the two factions of the game, but first, I'll cover them with the base knowledge a first-time player would know. Then, I'm going to dissect them a bit further by talking about how different endings and other deeper knowledge can paint them in a new light. Once that's out of the way, we can discuss which faction is definitively the good guy of this story. First, we have Arstotska, Glory Greatest Country. They've given you a job as a checkpoint inspector via a work lottery. You know they just finished a six-year war with Kalechia, and that's about it. Throughout the game, you're given little glimpses into their process, but they operate more or less how you would expect a Cold War era government to act. At one point, your sister is arrested and you come under inspection by an inspector due to a recent espionage-like activities, and he feels a bit like a Gestapo. You have a boss that's a bit of a dick, but there's nothing specifically terrible about him. You don't have any definitive evidence one way or another that this is anything more than your average government but they do give off dangerous vibes. These vibes are made even stronger towards the end of the game when you are told to start confiscating citizens' passports so they can't flee the country, and they even go as far as to take your and your family's passports. This isn't a good look, but you don't ever see anything come of it even with knowledge of all the endings. On the other side, we have the Azic Order. This is a secret society that claims two things. The first is that they helped establish Aristotska when it was formed. The second is that the government is filled with corrupt officials and it needs to be remade. They make this claim pretty early into the game, and there is actually little in-game evidence of this. The most corrupt thing you will even see is on day 20. Your boss asks you to make sure his friend gets through the checkpoint without issue, which isn't so bad, but... When she comes through, she doesn't have the correct paperwork, so he was basically asking you not to do your job and to let her pass through anyways. There are terrorists who are bombing and attacking the checkpoint, but the Ezek Order says they aren't the ones doing it. They say that, but they do ask you to kill two different people. They want you to believe it's for a good cause, but again, there really isn't any evidence in their favor, as the Arstotskan government is just having you do your job. Now, like I said, this is at a glance, and there are obvious issues past what I've said on both sides. So let's dive a little deeper. Arstotska only appears to be painted in a good light for two reasons. The first is because this is just genuinely what it'll look like, unless you reach one of the bad endings. The Arstotskan government is obviously quite corrupt, and getting jailed unfairly is the most common ending type. If you deny your boss his squeeze, he'll be pissed off, but, if you detain her like you're supposed to, he will arrest you for theft, which you did not commit, and sentence you to life of hard labor. This is a bullshit charge that reeks of corruption. The second reason they appear pretty good is because the paper is controlled by the government. That's not super clear in the game, but stick with me. At the beginning of each day, there's a newspaper shown to the player. It's called the Truth of Arstotska. This paper is actually based off of another Lucas Pope game. The game is called the Republia Times. It's set in the same universe as Arstotska. 
and is all about making propaganda for your country. The way the game works is that you as a journalist have the power to help empower or overthrow the government. The government in the game demands you print flattering stories about them or else. I think this is a major reason why the only way you can even hear about anything bad with the government is through the people trying to overthrow it. There is more evidence that Aristotska isn't all it's cracked up to be. You can't even have a playthrough where you try to be the perfect Aristotskan citizen 100% of the time, or it ends up in a bad ending. When you meet the inspector for the first time, you can give him some documents that an Essex agent gave you. You did not ask for these papers, and giving them to the inspector is what he wants. However, if you do, it will end up with you being arrested for consorting with suspicious groups. You have done nothing against the Aristotskan government, and keeping the documents would be considered a crime. But, instead of thanking you, they are arresting you. As if you are the bad guy. I said it before, but this isn't a long game, and your chances for being arrested for doing nothing is actually really high. If you remember, I mentioned briefly your sister being arrested. With all we know about what that entails, we can assume that your sister was likely arrested for bogus charges as well. And these are just two of the seven people in your family getting arrested for bogus charges. Imagine what's happening in the rest of the country. All right, we have a corrupt and greedy government just like the Ezek Order said. That makes the Ezek Order the good guys. Except there's actually a lot of evidence to support that they aren't the good guys. First, they ask you to kill people. I'm not saying that overthrowing the government doesn't happen without getting your hands dirty, but I'm saying that if you do kill both of the people they ask you to, not only do you get a bad ending, the Ezek Order loses. When you kill the second target, which their organization can't even agree on as a threat, then you're put in jail. This leads them to be unable to finish their coup because the next checkpoint investigator isn't as cooperative as you were. The order doesn't come off as a highly competent or moral group. So in the end, neither faction has a perfect run through because at one point in either playthrough, you will reach a bad end if you always try to help them. Also, if you never help them, they will try and kill you in the end if you don't kill them first. So while our Stotskin government is clearly corrupt, there is something extremely questionable about the Ezek Order as well. While the game The Republia Times gives a shot against the Aristotskan government, there is also something to be said in it about what's in store if the Ezek Order comes into power. In The Republia Times, your family is held hostage by the government to ensure your loyalty. If you try to overthrow the government, the rebellion will promise the safety of your wife and child. So you work with them to overthrow the government. However, the rebellion lied. Your wife and child are killed anyways, and then the rebellion gets you a new wife and kid. However, they are then immediately taken away from you to keep you loyal. They put you back to work at the papers, holding your family hostage so you produce their propaganda. A new rebellion pops up while you're supporting the old, and the game is just an endless cycle of rebellions and corrupt governments with no escape. Remember, the Ezek Order was at the inception of the Arstocking government. So who's to say the game won't repeat the cycle just like in the Republic of Times? So while both sides have obvious flaws, you can't even be caught on the fence in the middle without dire consequences. If you don't fully help the Order, or you don't fully help the Aristotskan government, you will die if you don't escape to Aberstan. The side that wins will kill you if you weren't 100% with them. So when it comes to the major factions of the game, it's a pick your poison kind of scenario. On the one hand, you can be a patriot that stands up to the terrorists, and on the other, a super spy that takes down a corrupt government. But in reality, either way, you're just a person trying to get as much power as you can with as little danger to yourself as possible. Because you're not going to help the people of Arstatska in any meaningful way, no matter what you do. So while the game appears to put you in the middle of a battle of good versus evil, once you learn more about the world, you find out that you're just the centerpiece between two terrible powers trying to be the last one standing. You're not any better morally for picking one side over the other, and there is definitively no good guy. This is why I said not knowing the outcome is so important, because once you reach the end of the game, you'll not only know that neither of the two powers are a good guy, 
you'll know if you were a good or bad guy the whole time. It's not who you put into power that decides whether or not you're a good person. It's how you treat each seemingly irrelevant person who comes to enter that tests the content of your character. So, how can you weigh the content of someone's character? While the moral choices in video games have been historically represented by some kind of point system, these morality points are usually less about who you are and more about gaining access to in-game mechanics. Things like unlocking certain skills, viewing specific cutscenes, interacting with or recruiting different characters, and even tied to different endings. These systems don't have any real moral consequences or difficult choices to make. What they do give you is incentive to make decisions based on the outcome of your choices. Aha! As an example of what I'm talking about, in Mass Effect 3, there is a point in time when one of your previous squad mates decides that in order to protect her daughter, she must kill herself. Stopping her from killing herself is considered the morally good option. While the moral alignment makes sense, this is not a compelling choice to make as a whole. There are three reasons you let her make that choice. The first is not to get the Paragon points. So, in all other circumstances, you would have saved her, but only because this is marked as a Paragon specific choice, you avoided it. The second is just to see what happens. Curiosity killed the Justicar and all that. The third, and least likely, is that you hate her. I say least likely not because everyone has to love her, but because this is far from the first chance you've had to kill her, and if you hated her, she'd be dead already. The thing is, by this point in the game, I bet that 99.99% .99 of people who let her die would not have done that given the option in real life, no matter how evil or morally bankrupt they were as a person. You may just say, it's a game, of course I would save them in real life. But that right there is what I mean when I say it's not compelling. A compelling choice is one that you have trouble making no matter what is happening. Games give you incentive to make these choices no one would ever make in real life. You only make them depending on what kind of effects you want to happen in the game, or how you want the story to unfold. Before I finish talking about the two factions in the last chapter, did you think I was going to reveal one of the factions was actually the good guys? That I was going to use little interactions or trace bits of evidence to say which group was truly the better choice? If you did, that's because developers have conditioned us to see these meaningless story choices as good or bad. And even in their most ambiguous endings, there is quote unquote a best option. These kind of moral choices force us to constantly make either all good or all evil decisions, because when a game has moral decisions, it's either all or nothing. While the endings aren't tied to morality, you either always help the Ezek or you never help them. That's how to unlock the two true endings. Games don't like to deal with the ambiguous gray areas, this area that almost all real life situations dwell in. And in other games, the morality of your character would have been tied to whichever of the two factions the developers saw as the good guys. This is the standard good guy versus bad guy of most video games. It's one of the reasons Paper Please always stands out to people who play it, even if they don't exactly know why. Having two losing options makes the third option the most compelling. If you've played the game, it might come as a surprise to you that I think the Aberstan ending is by far the most compelling. However, if you've stuck with me this far, I hope you're ready to see the final ending in a whole new light by the time I finish this video. Before we talk about the ending, we need to talk about the Milgram experiments. I believe this game is a wonderful take on the Milgram experiment, even if Pope didn't mean for it to be. For those of you that don't know what the Milgram experiment is, it's an experiment where you have a volunteer test subject, a scientist, and a paid actor. The experiment was proposed as a way to find out why the Germans of World War II were able to commit such unspeakable horrors. They wanted to test how far someone could be pushed by an authority figure to commit terrible atrocities. The setup of the test was as follows. The paid actor would be attached to a bunch of wires sitting in a chair in a room with a pane of glass 
between him and the other two. The test subject wouldn't know the actor's true identity and would believe that they are actually some other volunteer. The volunteer would be on the same side of the glass as the scientist and would be sat in front of the machine with a number of dials on it, which they believe would be used to shock the paid actor. The scientist would be sitting at a desk looking at the paid actor. The test was set up for the test subject to believe they were testing shock therapy on learning ability when in actuality they were testing how far a person would go to appease an authority figure. The test subject, or commonly referred to as the teacher, would present the paid actor, or the learner, with information and then quiz them on the information. If the learner answered wrong, the teacher would administer a shock and then ask them to try again. The machine didn't actually shock the paid actor, but they would act like it did. As time went on, and they gave more and more incorrect answers, the intensity of the shocks would go up, and the actor would act like it was getting worse and worse. The only thing keeping the teacher in the chair shocking the learner was the experimenter. The experimenter wouldn't force the teacher to continue, but would instead just ask the teacher in an authoritative voice to keep going. This led to 65% of the teachers administering the highest setting and supposedly fatal shock of 450 volts to the paid actor, and 100% getting over 300 volts. The purpose of this test showed how even normal everyday Americans had the potential for great atrocities in them if an authoritative figure pushed them. Every time I've heard about this experiment, everyone I was with always thought I would never do that. But once you know about the Milgram experiment, it will never work on you. So how can you really know for sure? Well, if you played this game, we're about to find out. While I'm saying this is a good candidate, I need to lay down some ground rules for why I think this is a Milgram experiment. First, the moral choices need to be ambiguous enough so that not every sane person would always make it. Like, would you switch a train's path that is set to kill five children to a track that would kill no one? That's not a good moral decision to ask because only a sociopath would let the train kill the five children. The second rule is there is a punishment for doing the right thing. In the original experiment, the punishment would have been disrupting the experiment and going against the authority figure. Even though that doesn't seem like a huge punishment, it was enough to cause all those people to administer a fatal shock. So no matter what the negative effect, there has to be one for doing the right thing. It has to cost you something. At the very least, you have to be worse off for doing the right thing than doing the wrong thing, but not significantly. This is important because no decision made while under duress is considered immoral. The third is that the cost I talked about in the second rule has to be something you don't mind paying normally. This may sound confusing, but what I mean is, if something good had come from disrupting the experiment, then those people would have gone against the authority figure in a heartbeat. For example, if it was a less stressful test and someone had come in and said they needed to speak with the test subject, that cost would have been the same as breaking the Milgram experiment, but they wouldn't have mind breaking either experiment to talk to that person. The final and most obvious rule, you need to be expected to make the wrong moral choice. The authority figure expects his commands to be followed. The test was set up so that you knew beforehand you were supposed to follow his directions. They agreed to this test. So while they were willing to take the punishment, and the cost isn't something they've ever really cared about before, every single rule they know is telling them not to help. This is the most important rule because this is the one that defines this test. It tells you that if you were ever told to do something morally wrong by an authority figure, if you do it or not. If you played this game, by this time you realize I've just described the main loop of Papers, Please. I've already gone over the gameplay some, and this game fulfills all four of these rules. Each one of the moral choices in the game are super ambiguous, each person that has to go through without paperwork. The cost of helping someone is a citation. You will get citations all the time. Unless your first time playing your god at passport paper inspection, you're going to accidentally let people through constantly. You might think that those were small accidents, but if you've ever stamped someone's ticket without knowing 100% if they were good or not for any reason, it doesn't matter if they were good or bad anyways, then you've paid that price when it served you. 
I'd say I'm pretty damn good at this game. But towards the end of a day, I start getting antsy and stamp half-checked documents. Clearly, I'm not worried about a citation. But when someone comes up to me and tells me up front that they don't have all their paperwork, every rule in the game is telling me to deny them. Because of these four rules, every time someone comes to you with a story and you deny them, you're administering a fatal shock in the Milgram experiment. The arguments that you're just following the rules of the game or that you should have had their information only stands if you've never stamped a card that you weren't 100% sure about. You're willing to stamp and pray for an extra five credits, but not when someone begs you to let them through. You make mistakes. Why not pay a citation so you can help these people out? You even get two free citations a day, so it might not even cost you anything. I've already established that the Aristotelian government isn't filled with the most savory characters. Following their rules to a T doesn't help anyone, including yourself. Did you collect the passports as a backup to help escape Abristan? If you did, then you're clearly willing to break protocol when it's for you. Or worse, did you deny someone who insulted you just because you could? If you did this, you are the worst kind of person. A person who abuses their power to hurt others. Did you approve Shay because your boss said not to hassle her? Did you deny all the people who wanted to see their loved ones, but help the Ezek Order agents when they don't have their paperwork? You may say it's a game, and that's why you made these choices. But this isn't really the kind of game where you let a squad mate commit suicide and then kill her daughter for the lols. When push comes to shove, you either do what you're told, or you did what was right. I'd like to point out some counterpoints to this. You may believe that they're up to no good and deserve to be denied. I would like to remind you that you were allowing every person to pass through the checkpoint on the second day as long as they didn't have any forged documents. It was just pointless bureaucracy that forced them to have more papers. You could then say that people who you've let through have bombed the checkpoints before, and I'd counter by saying you can now scan people. Someone isn't a risk if you can see what they've got on them. So why does a missing passport matter? You could point out that they might be up to no good and possibly be a criminal, but there are tons of people who have the right paperwork that we know are bad that we have to point out in the wanted section or just let through. No matter what reasoning you've come up with to deny these people who are begging for your help, the truth is you are doing the same thing the participants of the Milgram experiment did, trying to justify your actions. If you still don't believe me, and you say it's just what's right and it was too dangerous to let them through. There's an argument that blows that entire theory out of the water. Did you deny the man who asked you to? Because none of your arguments work against him. He has all of his paperwork in order and just wanted a denial stamp. If you didn't deny him, your entire argument falls apart. Unfortunately, now that you've heard this, it's too late. You can't judge what kind of person you're gonna be playing this game. A Milgram experiment isn't reliable once you know it's a Milgram experiment. But if you have a friend and you want to see what kind of person they are, you can try it with them. The first time I played through this game wasn't when I realized what I've talked about here. I was trying to unlock everything and improve some of the people asking for my help and denied others. It was when I watched a video years ago by the YouTuber Jacksepticeye that I came to this realization. He was much younger then, but Jacksepticeye has always been known for being a very kind person. He was flustered at times and did a lot of stamp praying. Then came the time for him to help the wife of the husband that just went through, and he denied her. I honestly couldn't believe it. His reasoning was that he's sorry there is nothing else he could do because that's the rules. But as I've said, that's just incorrect. This was the moment I realized what Papers, Please was. That this game was a present day Milgram experiment. I watched this absolute angel of a man denying a man's wife passage because he didn't want a citation even though she said they'd kill her if she went back. It was a powerful moment for me personally. Now Lucas Pope said when he made this game it wasn't to make any political statements. But when I saw Jack do that, I couldn't tell you how dumbfounded I was. This is in my opinion the main mechanic of the game that speaks to people. You're presented with many stories throughout the playthrough of people who need your help. And you either help them or deny them. 
I think the part that really sums all of this up is my favorite ending. If you decide not to take sides between the Ezek Order and Aristotska, there is one other ending that doesn't end in death or imprisonment. Once the government takes your family's passports, the man, the myth, the legend, Georgie, tells you about a passport forger he knows that can forge an Opristan passport. The forger just needs a real one as a base. So if you steal enough for you and your family when Aberstan citizens come through, you can escape to Aberstan. You might think this contradicts the morally good narrative, but I think it works well, actually. If you take the passport of someone who would have been denied, then you're causing them a mild inconvenience of needing it replaced, saving them a large inconvenience of being denied entry, and saving a family member's life. I now want to break down this ending with everything we've talked about because there are a couple of new ways of looking at it with what we know now. You are probably one of the better passport investigators in all of our Stotska at this point. And when you get your passports, you think they look awful. Your character, as an export in passports, is telling you, the player, that these passports look bad. He doesn't say they look like the real thing, or that they're barely passable, he says that they look like crap. You then take your family and these newly forged passports to the Auberstan checkpoint. You tell the inspector there that you want to visit your family in Auberstan. He tells you that he doesn't care and closes his window. This man isn't stupid. He sees the passports for what they are. Forgeries. He'll say to himself exactly what you did when you got them. These. Are. Crap. Maybe it's a misspelling. Maybe it's a mismatched ID number. No matter what it is, it's wrong, and you both know it. There is something else both of you know. You both know what's been going on in Arstotska. He knows right now that Arstotskan citizens are getting their passports confiscated. Looking at these passports, does he do what is expected of him? Does he detain you just like you detain so many other people at your checkpoint? Does he metaphorically crank the voltage up to 450 and wipe out your entire family? After every person you stopped from being with their loved ones, could you even blame him if he did? This is why the game being a Milgram test is so important. Because he faces a Milgram test for your fate. In your first playthrough, when you really cared about your actions, you may or may not have passed the Milgram test. But it doesn't matter. The man stamps your passports and gets a citation for each and every one of them. And he did it willingly. He lets you pass with your bogus passports. He is a good soul who didn't keep shocking just because he was told to. This ending leaves you with one of two feelings. Either you feel like you and he share a bond. You both have let people go when it was right to do so. You feel like the universe rewards those who have good souls, and that you and your entire family have earned their new life. But if you didn't pass the test, then you know in your heart of hearts that if it had been you in the inspection booth, you and your entire family would be dead. So did you pass the Milgram experiment? Don't worry if you didn't. First of all, it's all speculation and it's meant to be good fun. And Lucas Pope himself said a game is fun, first and foremost. Don't worry too much about the Milgram experiment if you failed. Like I said, almost everyone who does participate administers the lethal shock to the learner. It's really in human nature to listen to authority. Well, I'd like to stay in chit chat, but I have to get started on my next video ASAP. So remember, Aberstan above all, Bye bye